so glad that you've joined us and we hope that you've had a good week so far. Let's begin our worship this morning with hymn number 319. Hymn 319, Let Every Heart Rejoice and Sing. Let every heart rejoice and sing, like choral anthems rise. Ye aged men and children bring to God your sacrifice. For He is good, the Lord is good, and kind are all His ways. With songs and honors sounding loud, the Lord Jehovah prays. While the rocks and the rills, while the bills and the dews are glorious and the breeze. Let each prolong the grateful song and the God of our fathers praise. And the God of our fathers praise. He bids the sun to rise and set. In hand he his power is known. And it's up due to him shall yet. Bow low before his throne, for he is good, the Lord is good, and in kind are all his ways. His with songs and honor sounding loud, the Lord Jehovah prays. While the rocks and the rills, while the bills and the hills are glorious and some bring. Let each prolong the grateful song and the God of our fathers praise. And the God of our fathers praise. Amen. In chorus 102 will be our next hymn. Unto thee, O Lord. Unto thee, O Lord. Do I lift up my soul unto the O Lord? Do I lift up my soul, O oh my God? I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let all my enemies triumph over me. Let none that brave on thee be ashamed. Let none that brave on thee be ashamed. Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let all my enemies triumph. Over me, show me thy ways, Lord, teach me thy path, show me thy ways, Lord, teach me thy path, oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. In 439B will be our next hymn, and after this we'll have the opening prayer. 439B, and if it's convenient for you, will you please stand as we sing this hymn together. If I have wounded any soul today, if I have caused one foot to go astray, if I have walked in my own will, away, dear Lord, forgive. If I have uttered idle words, of him, if I have turned aside from want of him, lest I myself shall suffer through the strange yellow for him, for him. The sins I have confessed to thee, forgive the secret sins I do not see. Oh, 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, come to you this morning, acknowledging your presence in our lives, acknowledging that you are our Lord and our Father. But it's you who created us, it's you who has given us this blessing, opportunity to be part of your kingdom, the ability for us to gather here this morning worship you and sing praises to glorify your name. You are indeed worthy of praise and adoration. We thank you, Lord, for being our guide and guiding us throughout the week, the past week. Bring us here safely, in good health and in good spirits to worship you. Lord, we thank you for always being there for us, always being there with us. We thank you, Lord, for your continuous, continual providence upon our lives. For being our rock, being the anchor in which we stand fast in the winds, the turmoil and storms of life. As we look to thee, look to you for guidance, for help, Lord. We ask that we be with us as Christians, as humans in this turmoil world, that your light always shine through us, that we will always be the lighthouse and the light that people will be drawn to, people will come to in order to find peace and comfort. But now as we have one mind, Lord, to worship you this morning, as that all of us give our full attention to what proceedings of the worship this morning, that we will all be able to worship you written in truth, in a manner worthy and acceptable in your sight. In your name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn will be hymn number 651. 651, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. <coughs> Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus, we just me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountains. Sing like a fountain. All sufficient grace for even me. Rather than the scope of my transgressions. Greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Precious name. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaching to all the Lord. By it I have been pardoned. Saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder. Giving me liberty. Now the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Than the mountains, like a fountain. All sufficient grace for even me. Rather than the scope for my transgression, <clears throat> pardon all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most divine. By its transforming power, making him God's dear child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the match 
precious grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, like a fountain, sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, is the Father know my sin and shame, oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, Praise Amen. Please mark in number 149. In 149, and that will serve as a song of invitation after today's sermon has been delivered. Before we have the scripture reading and followed by the sermon by Brother Ng, let's sing hymn number 723. 723, Wonderful Words of Life. Mm -hmm. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life, let me more of your beauty see. Wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and beauty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Really echo the gospel call. Wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life. Jesus, the Holy Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Morning, brethren. Today's scripture reading will be from the book of James, chapter 3, verse 4 through 10. That is James, chapter 3, verse 4 through 10. And I will be reading from the New King James Version. It goes, Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. But they I wish all a very good morning. You know, we we introduced uh, the scripture just a while ago through Brother Fang Hao, quite a long one concerning the tongue. And that's where all our speech comes from, isn't it? Uh, this Today's uh, sermon title is everything to do with our speech. Uh, that is one of the most precious gifts that God has given to us, the ability for us to speak. By it, we communicate with each other. The effectiveness of our communication is very much dependent on the words that we use, not just the contents. Isn't it? So take, for example, today's this morning's sermon. The words can build up 
your faith or discourage you, you know, and 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 you can leave uh, the, the assembly, the worship feeling I'm not too good about about the things that I say. Teachers of God's word do have a great responsibility, and more so when they take to the pulpit. And it is my hope that this morning I'll be able to do right by you, sharing a lesson, a sermon that will help to build you up and to instill a good Christian values. Effective communication and trust are foundations for a good relationship. Together with our non-verbal communications, you know, the signs, the, the face, the disposition, our choice of words can affect how listeners respond. And so it is important that, that as much as it depends on us to speak wisely and to maintain peace and harmony that is in, taken from Rome, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. We all know that our speech has tremendous power. However, just as James has read by Rafang Hao a while ago, it is very hard to control. And unlike written words, our speech, you know, written words can be edited, they can be reviewed, they can be re-edited. But spoken speech or words that once are spoken cannot be retracted. Why? Because it's, it's done spontaneously. Oftentimes, you know, of the cuff, spur of the moment, we give an answer and that answer may not be adequately thought through. We we have to watch our words. Oftentimes, because we are so familiar with each other, right, in the church and all, we tend to let our guts down and we speak rather freely. Sometimes we joke about it, but then the message may be misunderstood. Perhaps we may be too direct, or we are insensitive to how the other person, the recipient, the listener will feel. And hopefully, because we are members of the church, we are members of the Lord's body, we are a family, we can be forgiving and then we make up. But to those outside the faith, we really need to take extra care, effort, to avoid you know, giving Christ a bad name. When conflicts occur, the Bible do have a lot of instruction for us you know, to, to use for mediation uh, so as to promote reconciliation. However, it is always better to go to the root of the problem than to re repair the damage after it's done. And that root, right, is our wisdom of speech. To speak well is to use words that impart grace. Kind, sensitive words, truthful words, loving and thoughtful words. And all this promotes, promote edification. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearer. Uh, in the American Standard Version or the New American Standard Version, it says, Let no unwholesome words proceed or come out of your mouth. The idea is, you know, words that come out can defile our, our body. Words can destroy and, and, and can, can uh, you know, hurt the, the recipient. Now, imparting grace to the hearer means that the one who hears receives it well. The one who hears knows that it's spoken out of love. And so the response is one that is favorable. Gracious words are a delight to the ears. In uh, Proverbs 16, verse 24, gracious words is sweetness of speech, like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and to the body. The Hebrew word for grace is merciful, compassionate, and soft-hearted. The grace-filled gentle words seek to bring out encouragement or healing. It focuses on the welfare of the listener, and flows from a mind that is consciously thinking of the right words to say and a heart that honors God. So we, we ought to be mindful of our speech, to put in extra efforts to control what we say because that words that we say, they do have far-reaching consequences. 
Our speech can motivate. Uh, it can help a person to scale to greater heights of achievement, or it can tear down the person's confidence and cause him to fail or just give up. It is too late to regret words that are spoken, that are negative, that causes or cause hurt. We may give excuses like, I wasn't thinking enough, or it's a slip of the tongue. It was not meant to be. That was not what I meant, or you know, I was only joking. All these excuses cannot sufficiently placate the offended party. Yes, sometimes we do speak too fast, and some words could be used in error or misquoted. And in such circumstances, we must immediately seek to correct the mistake and hope that the unintended message is forgiven. Take, for example, this scenario. Right? Uh, it's just for illustrative purpose. You, your, your elderly mother had just come to pay you a visit. Now, in your house, you have just purchased a new carpet, an expensive one, and you have put, placed it onto the living floor. And your mother, you know, being ever so thoughtful, decided to make you a cup of coffee. And he, she was bringing it to you on a saucer. And, you know, because the carpet was not there before, she overlooked because she was concentrating on the cup. And she tripped. And the cup of coffee was spilled onto the carpet. And your first reaction, your first comment that come out is, Oh, mum, look at what you have done. The carpet is new and the stain will be so difficult to remove. Imagine the sadness that she must have felt hearing your speech. Instead of showing concern as to whether she you know, was injured, you gave the impression that you care more about the carpet than her well-being. Your regret and apology would not easily soothe her hurt. When we talk about mindfulness of speech, we are also aware that many, you know, we are familiar with many people around us, especially in the movies, and that of our friends as well who use four letter words, four languages. And they do not realize that such languages that are filthy and they project an uncouth character. We Christians have no place for such words or actions. Actions that characterize our former self. We are supposed to be new creatures. And having put off the old man, we should act and speak words that are seasoned with grace. Going back to you know, the, the verse that I projected on the screen a while ago, Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer another. We know what salt is all about, but it has been used in various applications in the scripture to represent purity, uh, preservation, and wisdom. It is also applied metaphorically to describe speech that are tasteful to hear. And, and, you know, just as salt does to the food, it adds value to our speech and brings out the best those who hear our words. And so we need to make sure that our speech has a purifying influence to separate the conversation from that of the world because of the corruption in the world. And hopefully, it will be a source of blessing and inspiration to those around us. The manner in which we answer is important if we want to win over the conversation or win the other person over. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23, the verse says that a man has joy in an apt answer. And how delightful is a timely word, an apt answer. It is one that brings out the best outcome in the conversation. And the scripture says it's a delight to hear both to the speaker as well as to the listener. It may take the form of a soft answer when said at the right time. And it can turn away rough. Yeah, we know what happens when there is uh, anxiety all around or when there's tense, a tense situation, right? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. It will make the situation worse. 
one that is given graciously, a soft answer, seasoned with salt, right, will bring about a good solution, which is what harsh words cannot do. Salt in our speech makes what we have to say easier to hear. It brings a different flavor to what could otherwise be an unsavory conversation. And this is especially needful when we have a hard truth to share with someone. In Matthew chapter 15, sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, Jesus used the analogy of salt and light to describe the effect that we have on others. In verse 13, regarding salt, he says that we are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, lost its flavor, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown away from out and be trampled upon by others. Christians are to be agents of good upon others. As salt, we allow ourselves to project good taste and as light, we shine forth so that others may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, Paul gives a very practical advice on avoidance of conflict. Whether it is dispute concerning words which does no good, which in uh, verse 14, all right, 2 Timothy verse 14, Paul says, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of hearers. Or as in verse 23 to 25, foolish words, ignorant disputes or controversies, he tells us not to be engaged in them as they break quarrels which are not profitable. The words that Paul used, the key words, is very instructive. He says, avoid dispute. What kind of dispute? Foolish and ignorant dispute. Be gentle. Exercise humility, especially in correcting others. Teach and help them to know the truth. What kind of manner of speech must we have? Well, in, in an earlier verse, in verse 22, he says, A speech spoke, spoken from a pure heart, having pursued righteousness. Our correction must be accompanied by, um, by a mild and friendly and good natured demeanor. Patience against stubborn resistance with a gentle attitude towards, towards the receiving opposing view. This is what we are called to do a speech that is accompanied with a spirit of humility so that the opposing, opposing party will more likely come. To his senses and then you know may repent and be won over let me give an illustration on how to you know correct uh in a manner of humility and i'm going to use Ryan lee because it's a good spot to illustrate this view someone took offense against what he has just what he has done or said and and you know uh Rajanku knowing that it is not Right, that Ellen Lee did not intend to offend the other party or hurt the other party, his intention is for good, tells this guy that in this manner perhaps, I value our friendship and I want you to know that I have the highest regard for you and I need you to hear what I got to say. I wish to apologize first if I am going to hurt your feeling, but I need you to know, to realize that what you said to Brother Ellen is wrong. And then Brother Chang Kun goes on to explain. Seeking reconciliation and forgiveness demonstrates humility and the desire to restore harmony in a relationship. Let's look at another form of speech which is called jesting. Right? Uh, I'm on the screen is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. Yeah? Fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting of sins. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And in that list, you know, of 
previous sin that are not proper is called jesting. Referring to dirty jokes with sexual references. The Greek word for cause jesting is eutrophilia, reference to vulgar, lewd, or foul mouth humor. You know, cause jesting and crude jokes are attempts to elicit laughter, a laugh by using foul languages, and, and we do have experiences with some of those before. Right? Words that are immoral, right? Uh, we ought not to be associated with them. Uh, words that offend and hurt some people, we ought to stay clear. And Paul also used the word fool, foolish thought, right? Uh, which comes from the Greek word morologia, a um, combination of two words. One is moros, uh, meaning stupid. The other one, lego, meaning uh, speaking, um, I, I believe the word leg, uh, logos also comes or is associated with this. Logos meaning speech or word. Yeah? And, and so the, the implication, the meaning is fairly clear. Foolish talk is absurd, meaningless, or idiotic. Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 35 to 37 has this to instruct us a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And he says, I say to you, for, for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And before we joke, right, it is proper for us to consider whether it reflects a heart of goodness that will bring about justification. And if we honestly examine our humor along those lines, it will keep us away from cause jesting. Instead of being false and crude, crude, Paul encouraged us to speak words for education. The same verse that I've shown just now, which requires us to speak wholesome words to impart grace, it's also good for edification, right? Wholesome words or non-corrupt words can bring about healing, it can offer hope, hope, but unwholesome words inflict wounds, tear down confidence, and spread despair. Jesus' speech is an example of graciousness and edification. Those who were with him Witnessing what he has done and the words that he spoke, he says that they marvel at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And you know what they, they say among themselves? It, it's not Joseph's son, a carpenter's son. Can he speak such gracious words? Proverbs 25 verse 11 says, A word fitly spoken, right, or apt, spoken. It's like apples of gold in setting of silver. That's the value of our good speech. And so we must recognize the weight of our word, what it carries, and the responsibility to use them wisely. One way of ensuring that we speak words that edify is to follow the advice of James. In chapter 1, verse 19 of James, it says that, So then, my brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Quick to hear. Management guru calls this active learning. He said, make an attempt to understand the other person, listen carefully to their feedback, and then answer. There's a song that says the words, you know, don't come easy to me. Sometimes that's very true in our life. You know, we... we we need time to reflect and to use the right words for the right occasion and to make sure that our speech you know, impart grace to the hearers. What kind of edifying speech? For example, if you, you like the lesson from the, the preacher, right? When Brother Elvin does, did a good job, then you give him this praise. You did a good and excellent sermon. Brother Elvin, keep up the good work. This kind of speech acknowledges and appreciates someone's effort and builds them up with your sincere praise. 
empathetic speech. I've shown on the screen Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 13. Right? Christians who are the so-called chosen people of God, holy and beloved, we must put on a heart of compassion, of kindness, of humility, of gentleness and patience. We need to bear with one another and forgive each other, one another. And then whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as Jesus forgave us, so we too must do also. Empathy is the capacity to feel another person's pain and suffering and to exercise compassion. The Apostle Peter counseled Christians to have a compassion for one another, love one another as brothers, be tender-hearted and be courteous. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. And Paul himself, more than just Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 13, says that we need to exhort our fellow Christians. How? By rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn. Romans 12, verse 15. We can associate very much with the rejoice with those who rejoice, isn't it? But Chang and I, we just were in Singapore rejoicing, you know, uh, over a good feast, uh, the marriage of Zilling uh, to Justina. Uh, what a wonderful celebration they had. But to mourn with those who mourn, you know, is to, the Bible says that it's better to go to a house of mourning than a house of festivity or entertainment or, you know, the idea is this, we empathize, we share in the grief of the person. And I think we have done quite well, you know, uh, as a congregation. Uh, when, when my mom passed away, when Brother Stephen passed away, we were there in large numbers to comfort the bereaved. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, Paul has this to say. He says that to the weak I become as weak, that I may win the weak. I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. I think that is empathy. The idea is for others to see him as one of them, to share in their plight. Jesus was likewise sensitive to the plight of those around. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And the best of empathy, as one who shows empathy, is none other than God himself, who personally feel, feels the pain of his people. In Psalm chapter 56, verse 8, the scripture says that, God, you keep track of my sorrows, you have collected all my tears in your bottle, and you have or recorded each one in your book. Please ignore the 10314. Throughout the Bible, we are instructed to have a heart of compassion and empathy. When we show empathy, the words that we say must reflect understanding, care and concern, as well as compassion. Let me give you an example of a word, of words spoken in, with empathy. Perhaps it goes this way. I can see that you're going through a very tough time. If you ever need someone to talk to or to support you, I'm here for you. Showing understanding and offering a listening ear, demonstrate kindness and compassion, providing comfort and support to those in need. And power of the tongue, as read just a while ago, I, the reason why I chose these verses is because it's very long and I, I wanted uh, Fang Hao to, to do, do it and he did it very well. So, it starts with chapter, uh, it starts with verse 3, right? Chapter 3, verse 3. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. He is able to bridle the whole body indeed. We put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. And then where Fang Hao continued, look at the ship, too large, driven by fierce wind, yet they are turned by a small rudder, wherever the pilot tires. The tongue is actually very small, isn't it? A little member, but it holds a great many things. And the illustration 
that the tongue is like a small fire, like a fire, right? And it sets on fire because of nature. It can defile the whole body and sets it on hell, on fire of hell. We, we, we understand the consequence of a big fire, a fire that goes out of control. Right? Words can do that as well. If you read the paper and, and, and you have friends traveling to, to the States now or to Canada, the eastern part of the, the continent, for the last two months, fire is raging the forests of Canada. And, and you know, the, the smoke is felt as far away as where? Georgia in South eastern United States. That's how bad the, the, the smoke is. In Toronto, it described as the worst uh, haze that they have encountered in recent times, in many, many years. Fire can do that if we are not able to control it. The scripture says that the tongue is an unruly evil, right? Full of deadly poison. With it, we bless God and the Father, and with it we curse men. Imagine, you know, men that are made in the likeness of God, and we curse. You know how God feels? And the scripture says that in verse 10, out of your same mouth comes cursing and blessing. This ought not to be. Later on, in, in, in the verses that follow, James says that, can a fig tree produce olive? Or, you know, Can, can something, the, the spring produce bitter water? Spring supposed to produce sweet water. It's not consistent. Paul uses this illustration. He says that what communion has light with darkness? Or for that matter, you know, those who are righteous against the unrighteous. And that's why he tells, uh, Paul tells us, do not be unequally yoked with non-believers. Because what has righteousness to do with unrighteousness? The idea is we do not want to be unduly influenced by evil in the world or wrong in the world. That instrument of speech, which is our tongue, is very difficult for us to control. And James said it is a perfect man who does not stumble in his words. He took to great length in discussing the power of the tongue. Right, A small member yet like a rudder can steer a large vessel, or like a fire can destroy a forest. We have, we have, we have a many a creature, James says, but not so with the tongue. No human beings can tame the tongue fully. But we must not give up. We must not quit trying. The idea is start with the heart. The words, the words that we speak. They reflect what is in our heart. Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth goodness, isn't it? The, the scripture that we read just now. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. If we speak from a heart that is full of sin, we will pour forth the poison of evil. But if we speak from a heart that is seasoned with grace, with sort of grace, then we pour forth wisdom from above. Effective communication is choosing the right words, speak the right way, at the right time, and for the right reason. In the flyer that we, we, we sent out, you know, to invite or to give, introduce what is coming in this week, right? I, the, the word it says that speak what you mean, mean what you say, and do not by any do not be mean in the way you present it. The Bible tells us that the tongue has the power of life and death. It is not just power over the life of the listener, but also the that of the speaker. In First Peter chapter three, verse ten to eleven, right? Peter has this to instruct us: whoever loves life. Whoever loves to see good days, they must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. 
and seek peace and pursue it. Now, if words really is not easy for you to say because you just do not know what to say, or the situation does not permit for you to say anything, then it is best to keep silent. That's what Job's three friends did, isn't it? They came to see Job in the midst of his really, really, really terrible suffering. And as a show of empathy, they kept silent for seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him because they saw his grief and it was very grief. At least for that seven days, they kept quiet. In times of sorrow, sometimes silence speaks volume. And the scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7 says that there is a time to keep silent and a time to speak. I want to share a story about you know, this little poor boy without shoes. He goes about barefooted and he was attending college. right? And he decided to go to a Sunday worship in, in a crowded church. And there was no empty seats available for him in the assembly. You know, he walked down the aisles and, and he was all seated and he decided to squat right there. Uh, on, on top of the, the, the steps, on the, of course, in, in, in the States, they have called carpets. And so, fairly comfortable. The preacher continued to preach, and the boy, you know, was quite disheveled. And, 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 and what people were observing him, you know, they were quite uh, unnerved by, by this little boy. Then, from, from far away came an elderly man, a member of a church, whom everybody thought was going to, you know, reprimand the boy, and they all held their breath. But that old man sat instead sat next to this boy throughout the whole worship, the whole morning. And that scene touched the congregation so much that many had teary eyes. This is how, you know, when, when words are not necessary, this is how we can be salt of the earth even without speaking a word. And I believe some of our lady members may be familiar with this account because it's taken from the book Out of the Salt Taker, describing how we can be an influence for good in the world. When we do not know the words, let us pray to God, study the scripture and seek his wisdom. Learn to speak like the good servant in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, who proclaimed, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. Brethren, having speech that is gracious and seasoned with salt, they don't come naturally. Just as Isaiah 50 tells us, verse 4, we need to have the tongue of the learned. We need to learn. We need to study. We need to train ourselves so that we are able to tame the tongue. And this requires hard work and energy. It requires effort so that we can speak more and more with grace. And in so doing, we can proclaim to the world the good news of the gospel. The attention that we give to speech is very important when the hearer, especially the hearer, is one whom is looking to us for leadership, for us to impart words of grace so that we can help to their sensitive emotion. Let us learn also to express gratitude and appreciation. Let us also be liberal in complimenting others. Take, for example, when visiting preachers come our way to share God's word. Let us extend our hospitality, our grace. Not just, you know, uh, leaving it to some members of the church, but every one of us can play this role and train ourselves to be, to, to be able to, you know, compliment, to be able to share words that are graceful. Thanking them after they have delivered their lesson. Preachers, 
who come from afar, having put in hard work to prepare lessons, they, they do need encouragement. Especially when they travel to a faraway congregation, they are going the extra mile. And we should rush to thank them after their sermon. Brethren, I've shared with us this morning the following key points. Season with salt, humility in correcting others, false jesting, edifying speech, and pathetic speech, and then just a while ago, the power of the tongue. And the first letter of each word, right, they will come together to form the word speech. Our speech should never leave a bitter taste, a bitter aftertaste, but produce a pleasant sweetness. Let us use words that you know bring about healing, bring about reconciliation, bring about a positive transformation in the lives of those around us. Let us be an instrument of good and an instrument of peace because there is just too much suffering and hurt in the world. You know, and, and, and each of us can do our part to, to make the world a better place. Let, us, let, let me end again. You know, I'm becoming a little bit predictable, I know. Um, I, I have always tried to use words to describe a, a, lengthy, a lengthy subject, condense it into a, a, a short poem. Uh, I know sometimes it doesn't do justice, but I thought, you know, since time permits me, I will just share this, this poem on gracious speech. Yeah. The tongue is like a little rudder, steering the ship as a pilot desires. It sets on fire the course of nature. It imparts grace, its hearers inspire. Can the tongue be bridled to cause no blunder as beats in a horse, in horse's mouth? To tame the speaker, that it may speak kindly with calm demeanor, promoting reconciliation, repairing the fracture. Words spoken can inflict hurt and harm, unlike written speech, edited till it's done. Gracious words can soothe like a healing balm, diffuse a tense situation, a tense situation in stealing calm. Strive not about unprofitable words. Season your speech with kindness and wisdom. Gently and patiently the spirit is stirred, giving comfort to a soul, lifting his burden. When conflicts arise and emotions flow, may the speech with sought blessings bestow, correcting the opposition, whether friends or foes, in humility, winning the other side over. Gracious words are like honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. Like symphony of words in a melodious song, serenading the weak, wearied and worn. As Jesus, our example, showed tender mercy, let us trouble not the other be. In gracious speech, there is a key to heal, to strengthen, provide relief. Let us be quick to listen, slow to speak. Words spoken or written gracious and sweet. Be imitators of Christ, the Bible and traits. Give cheer to the weary. Do a good deed. And with that, I end my sermon. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, let us arise as we sing the song of encouragement. <laughs> Turn and listen, say and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Take his yoke, for he is meek and lowly, bear his burden. Give him terms. He who called it the master holy. He will teach him if you will learn. Ye can labor and are 
heavy laden beam upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and a heavy laden, amen, if you rest. Then his loving tender voice so be ye, that if you his burden take, find a yoke his hand is on you lay it, light and easy for his sake. Ye the labor and a heavy laden lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and a heavy laden, a man not will give you rest. Please be seated. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 337. In 337, Lo, in the grave he lay. <clears throat> Though in the grave he lay, he said, my Savior, waiting the coming day, he said, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph of his foes, he arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to ring. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Inly they watch his head. He said, my Savior, mainly this the day. He said, my Lord, up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph of his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his grave, Jesus, my Savior. He tore the bars away, Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph of his foes. He arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Let us all bow our heads and pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning that we as Christians are able to assemble here with one another, to sing songs of praise, to honor and glorify their name, to study a portion of thy word. But as we are about to partake the first element of Lord's Supper, which is the unleavened bread that represents the body of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that was crucified on a cross some 2,000 years ago for the remission of sins, we pray that we partake it in a manner that is pleasing to thyself, and help us, Lord, to examine ourselves as we take it and proclaim his death till he comes again. All this we pray and give thanks in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.
Let's hold on to the unleavened bread and we will take it together as a congregation. A city of the eleven bread together. Let's pray. The Lord, our Almighty Father in heaven, hello be thy name. As we approach the and partake the second element of the Lord's Supper, which is the fruit of the vine, it symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed on the cross of Calvary. We remember the pain. The suffering, the agony that Jesus had to go through so that we can be reconciled back to thee. We pray and thank you for this great sacrifice we, and we pray as we partake of, his, of this fruit of the vine that we partake it in a manner which is pleasing in thy sight and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Similarly, we'll hang on to the fruit vine and take it together as congregation. Let's partake of the four divine together. As the offering backs up and passed out, we'll sing chorus 87. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. And thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let us all with one accord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all unite in song and praise Him all day long. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Please reveal your will for me, so I can serve to eternity. Use my life in every way, take hold of it today. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we indeed thank you, Lord, for so many things that you've given to us and blessed us with. We thank you for the security that we enjoy in our lives through material blessings. And we thank you for the fruits of spiritual blessings that we also enjoy. We thank you for the family that we have, especially our spiritual family here. We pray that as we've set aside a small portion of what you've given to us for the purposes of the church, that it will be used wisely <clears throat> and carefully and for the furtherance of your glory in this region and beyond. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ who has made things possible for us. In his name we pray. Amen.
In closing, we'll sing Chorus 79, Shine, Jesus Shine, and if it's uh, convenient for you, we invite you to stand as we sing this hymn together, following which we'll have the closing prayer. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness, shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth, you now bring us, shine on me. Shine on me, Lord Jesus, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory, bless this Set our hearts on fire. Lord, love the wind of bloom. Love the nations with grace and mercy. Set for the world. Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence. From the shadows into your radiance, by your blood I may answer your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me, shine on me, my Jesus, shine, Jesus, shine, this land. With the Father's glory, bless the Spirit, bless set our hearts on fire. The river bloom, bless the nations with grace and mercy, set for the world. Lord, and let there be light. Shall we pray together? I think, Father, we're so grateful for this moment that we have, that we're able to assemble together as Christians and as children of nine, we're able to come together and worship the Lord God Almighty. We're grateful for you, dear Father, for giving us this morning that we're able to take to reflect on our lives, and most importantly, to remember to prioritize you, your word, and your church first. We're grateful for the lessons that we have heard this morning, and for the sermon that is reminding us also of this powerful tool that we have that can make or can break, that can build up or can tear down. We pray, dear Father, that we become a lot more mindful with our speech, that it is one that is filled with grace, one that edifies and encourages others. Knowing full well, dear Father, that is both our obligation and our responsibility, but it's also a blessing that we have that we can use to bless others. That is through our example and through our lives that the world may see that you have sent Jesus when we are united. We're grateful, dear Father, also this past week that we are able to learn of the successful surgeries and procedures of Sister Lili Tan, of Brother Seka, as well as Brother Kwan. We're so grateful that. All is well with them and they are on a good path of recovery. But thankful that you continue to watch over and provide for your children. And we pray, dear Father, that we will continue to be safe, to be healthy, but also that we may live more days here on this earth to enjoy your blessings and to be a blessing to others. We close this morning's worship, dear Father, also of a reminder of that home that has been prepared for us and Jesus has gone on to prepare for us. We are grateful, dear Father, that you have provided this avenue of salvation, that even though there are times on this earth when we may feel discouraged, we may feel alone, we may feel the pain and suffering of what it is like to be human, we're reminded that there is a place that is prepared for us, one that is for eternity, one that is only good, one that is beautiful, being able to be in your presence. And so we pray to Father that we continue to walk our lives in accordance to your word, one that has your word that is the lamp unto our feet, the light unto our path. We pray, dear Father, that we continue to keep each other accountable, but also to keep each other encouraged, that we may all be at that place one day. This is our prayer. In your son's name we pray and ask these things. Amen.
Church would like to thank Brother Sam for the Bible class and Brother Eng for the sermon. <clears throat> so he traveled with me to Singapore on Thursday morning uh, and he came back. We came back together on Saturday, yesterday morning. Uh, so I told him maybe this sermon you, uh, will be without poem. Uh, uh, we, we appreciate his effort. Uh, that's a sh- uh, bit short uh, time. So he still uh, managed to produce a poem uh, for his sermon. <coughs> we appreciate it. <coughs> uh, this Wednesday, Brother Wen Kai will be conducting the midweek Bible class. On, uh, we'll be on Sing and Pray. Uh. Uh, next Sunday, for Bible study, Brother Andrew Kui will be uh, teaching. will be on Absalom Rebels. Uh. Then for sermon, we'll have Brother Edwin Lee uh, who will be uh, saying a sermon. It, the title is The Five C's of Christian Success. So this um, morning, we have uh, visit friends right, as well as visiting brethren who worship with us. Uh, we want to thank Brother uh, and Sister Sandra and his son Gavin, and we also want to thank Ming Fu. Yeah. Uh, church program uh, uh, yesterday, the uh, you have their fellowship, uh, combined uh, fellowship at Subang Jaya. So, we want to uh, thank Brendan who, uh, who support the uh, youth fellowship from KK. Uh, <coughs> We have brethren from Klang as well as from uh, Subang Jaya who joined the uh, Youth Fellowship. There will be ladies, uh, uh, there will be Sunday School Open Day on 29 July. Uh, Sunday School Open Day on 29 July <coughs> from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. The church also would like to thank Brother Willie for uh, for contributing uh, articles uh, in our bulletin. Um, this week is a, a part two on serving others as a way uh, to grow our faith. Uh. Um, last week was part one. Uh, that's all from my end. Uh, Michelle, please. Uh.